Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's good to see everyone here today. Um, today's service is, is going to be a tiny bit different. Uh, I'm mostly, it's mostly going to be kind of leaning into Shabbat itself. We will have a little bit of time of talking about the Torah passage for this week, but I'm also going to be, um, we have some poetry that we'll be mixing along the way and, um, uh, so very, um, I I don't know. I'm hoping it'll be meaningful and will be a um, a bit of a respite. I, for a lot of us in the U.S., we're having a lot of complicated feelings right now and some challenging dynamics. So, I thought today for Shabbat we really need to lean into Shabbat uh, to help us to keep moving forward. So, um, so to begin with this first poem I'm going to share. This is one by a an author that I really have have fallen in love with many times Wendell Berry. He's an agrarian writer. Um, I will say this poem has one brief theistic reference, but other than that, it's really not very theistic. So that's why I'm going ahead and using it. So let me share screen for this. And this is kind of, I guess you might, it's an opening meditation. You might say it's a little bit of a longer poem. I think like four minutes long, but um, I think it's, it's worth the, the, the length. So if I can get to the right screen, how do I? Okay, Let's there see. we go. And everyone's hearing the sound, right? Okay. No, that's all right. That's not no one starting at the beginning. Let me let me refresh this and maybe it'll start from the beginning. There we go. Sabbaths, 1979, four, written and read by Wendell Berry. The bell calls in the town where full bears cleared the shaded land and brought high daylight down to shine on field and trodden road. I hear but understand contrarily and walk into the woods. I leave labor and load, take up a different story. I keep an inventory of wonders and of uncommercial goods. I climb up through the field that my long labor has kept clear. Projects, plans unfulfilled, waylay and snatch at me like briars. For there is no rest here where ceaseless effort seems to be required, yet fails and spirit tires with flesh, because failure and weariness are sure in all that mortal wishing has inspired. I go in pilgrimage across an old fenced boundary to wildness without age, where in their long dominion the trees have been left free. They call the soil here Eden, slants and steeps, hard to stand straight upon, even without a burden. No more a perfect garden, there's an immortal memory that it keeps. I leave work's daily rule and come here to this restful place where music stirs the pool and from high stations of the air fall notes of wordless grace, strewn remnants of the primal Sabbath's hymn. And I remember here a tale of evil twined with good, serpent and vine, and innocence as evil stratagem. I let that go a while, for it is hopeless to correct by generations' toil, and I let go my hopes and plans that no toil can perfect. There is no vision here but what is seen. White bloom, nothing explains, but a mute blessedness exceeding all distress the fresh light stained a hundred shades of green. 
uproar of wheel and fire that has contained us like a cell opens and lets us hear a stillness longer than all time where leaf and song fulfill the passing light pass with the light return renewed as in a rhyme this is no human vision subject to our revision god's eye holds every leaf as light is worn. Ruin is in place here, the dead leaves rotting on the ground, the live leaves in the air are gathered in a single dance that turns them round and round. The fox cub trots his almost pathless path as silent as his absence. These passings resurrect a joy without defect the life that steps and sings in ways of death. I chose that poem just because I thought it kind of helps to set the stage for our exploration of Shabbat. And it's an, it's an invitation to connect with the natural world um, and a reminder of just, I don't know, I, I, I liked it. So let me um, turn off screen share for a second while I queue up the next part here. Uh, who would like to read uh, the English on uh, for the for this one? Let me see if I can get, sorry, my thing is put placing the, there we go. That's better. Who would like to read the English for this? How good are the dwellings where we gather, serene and vibrant as the gardens by the river, the aloes and the pleasant cedar trees besides the water. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for people to dwell together in harmony. Let us sing. <speaking in Hebrew> Chevaramim gam yakad, ine matovu manahim, chevaramim gam yakad. And who would like to read this, either in, read or sing in, in Hebrew or English? Go ahead and unmute yourself and go for it. And we, humanity, choose to keep a day of rest as an agreement for all time. For in six days we work, and on the seventh we cease from work and are refreshed. Would anyone like, as was feeling moved to sing the Hebrew side today? Vishomrim benehadam et hashabat, la sot et hashabat le doros and berbitolam. Vishomrim benehadam et hashabat, la sot et hashabat le doros and berbitolam. Kisheshed yami masu melaka, asu melaka. Uh, Vishamrim Benehadam, Vishamrim Benehadam, Met Hashahabat, La Sot et Hashahabat, Le Doros and Berito Horlam, Uviom Hashvi, Shav to Vaina Fashu, Shav to Vaina Fashu, 
Shaktu vayin fashu veshomrim bane adamet hashabat lasot et hashabat le durotum berbitoholam. And we now come to our version of the Barku. I'm going to stop the screen share for a moment because what we do for this is to take a moment to look at the people we see on our screen to imagine them filled with joy and happiness. And so, and just also to recognize in this moment the connections we have across uh, the oceans, across the whole world, that people from many different places. Today, I know we have people from the US, we have Panama, we have the UK, we probably have other places as well. And it's just so good seeing, seeing all of you today and recognize those connections we all have. All right, my Zoom is not, oh, there we go. Let us bless the community which blesses us. Blessed is the community which blesses us forever and ever. Barku et hakala hamevarak, baruch hakala hamevarak lialam va'ed. And now we come to the Shema. Who would like to uh, recite this? Listen, Yisrael, our people are one, humanity is one. Let us work together to improve this world. Shema Yisrael, Echadam Enu, Adam Echad, Ulanu Navo Letzakein, Et Haholam, and let us pause for a moment to listen to the world around us. And who would like to read the Vayavta? Uh, okay. And let us love our fellow as ourselves, with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our might. And let those words be always upon our hearts. Impressing them upon our children, reciting them when they, we stay at home and when we go out, when we lie down and when we get up. Binding them as signs in our hand, serving as a symbol on our forehead, inscribing them on the doorposts of our homes and on our gates. And who would like to read uh, the Emmet Ve Emuna? This we believe to be true. Humankind is capable of redeeming itself from its troubles. Through our efforts, we heal disease, feed the hungry, lift up, and free the downtrodden. We can achieve liberation through reason, compassion, and working together with trust in one another, with faith of a better future for all. Blessed is the light and humanity with which we redeem the world. Amen. And so now I'm going to go, we haven't done this in the, the last few services I've led, but I want to want to do this today because I think it's a helpful one to ground us in the moment we're in and to pull us even deeper into the, the uh, Shabbat. So for this, uh, this meditation, um, it's, it's, um, it's kind of as meant as a, as a, um, is 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 a whole different change of pace. And so it's a, it's a meditation uh, it's a breath meditation. Uh, I'll be talking about breathing in, breathing out. But if that's a comfortable for you to follow, great. If you breathe at your own pace, that's fine too. But feel free to turn off your camera if you'd like. Whatever you, is will make you more comfortable for the, for this time. Breathing in, I take breath into myself. Breathing out, I join the web of being. Breathing in, I rest in the present. Breathing out, I am part of past and future. Breathing in, I honor the shrine of my body. 
Breathing out, I honor the shrine of the cosmos. Breathing in, presence fills me. Breathing out, presence enfolds me. Breathing in, I witness what is broken. Breathing out, I bow to what is perfect. Breathing in, I offer gratitude for what is. Breathing out, I accept all that changes. Breathing in, I pray for peace for myself. Breathing out, I pray for peace for all beings. And we'll pause for a moment of silent reflection. Well, this morning for our our bit of Torah, I um, had previously planned something a little different, but uh, this morning I really, I, I kind of threw it all out the window because I really, as I grappled with this text again, I realized that there's an element of it that... Um, I think several of several of folks in, on this uh, this uh, we've had as a members of our community can relate to, and that is the how this tour portion begins. So I'm going to share screen for a moment, and we're going to read the, a little bit of this this portion. Um, I have a few thoughts for you to share, but then we'll move into some discussion. And so this this is the, the right at the beginning of this tour portion in Leklaka. It's in Genesis 12. So yod heh vav -He said to Abram, Go forth from your native land and house to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and curse the one who curses you. And all the families of the earth shall bless themselves by you. Abram went forth as yod heh vav -He had commanded him. And Lot went, went with him. Abram was 75 years when he left Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the wealth they had amassed and all the persons they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. And by the way, I'm going to put this, um, the text chat, uh, just in case anyone wants to look at it um, while we're having this discussion. There's a few th things about in Torah. We always have the complexity of the, the layers of, of history and culture between us and them. This is a very different world than ours. Uh, one of the things that to me immediately jumps out is this is a world where slavery is practiced. We hear them talking about Abram taking the people he had acquired with him on this journey. And that's very troubling. And I, I want to acknowledge that, but it's... Um, I just that thing's important to acknowledge that. But the other piece of this text that really jumped out this morning was was that Abram and how the story is told is he received a call from from the from from, from God, said get, get up and go, lick lick up. And while as humanists we don't believe in a interventionist deity who says who gets involved in human history. Um, and again, humanists vary all over the map of what we believe about God or don't believe about God. But the one thing we're pretty united on is that we don't believe in an interventionist deity. Uh, so this part of the story already is is something that we we may not completely relate to. But what does relate to me to me in reading this a lot is the issue of immigration. Is this is this is a family unit that has decided they are going, they are leaving, they are getting up and going. And for Abram, it's framed as being about his faith. It's about his his God telling him to go go in a different direction, and to enter into a new covenant, and to have this 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 idea of promises being made to this family. 
But I think today that for many people, I was talking with uh, Gabrielle earlier in the week, who's part of our, our community and some others about this as well. People who have, 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 have immigrated. And for many of us, if we ourselves didn't immigrate, great, maybe it was our parents or our grandparents who did. But this is a part of the story of humanity, and it's frankly a big part of the Jewish story of human beings having to migrate, having to be in a different place, having to leave the life they had before to, to move into another place and time. And so I just kind of want to open this up for some conversation about this and this issue of how how for us our Jewishness might affect how we think about this story but also our own personal stories, the stories of our family. So uh, we'll have about 10 minutes or so for some conversation. So feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, if you want to use the raise hand function, that's fine too. Uh, but let's, let's have a little conversation about this text. Mostly what I'm seeing is people who are so devastated by what happened in the election, that they're thinking of leaving and going somewhere else. There's, there's a lot of discussion around about that. I think it's very premature, <laughs> nevertheless, yeah. um, with somewhat of a rise in anti-Semitism, it doesn't help you there. You go anywhere, it's the same. So that's not really an issue, but, um, you know, you, you give it a thought in the back of your mind, where would you go? Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, hard it's been find, on my mind a lot. It's hard to find a good answer to that. <laughs> I think the complexity um, is, is that Abram, he was able to bring his whole family with him. Most of us, we wouldn't, that wouldn't, that's, that's one of the things that keeps me here is my extended mm -hmm. family that I don't want to not be a part of their lives, but it's hard to imagine staying here for a long time either. I think about um, the the bravery that it requires to be <clears throat> to be able to to leave the land that you know, the land that's familiar, and where you know maybe you've built an entire life and um, go somewhere else because you have a belief, you have a hope, even that things might be better. Um, and you don't know what's waiting for you there. You, and it might even include a people that don't want you there um, when you arrive. Um, I think about, uh, you know, the situation, yes, currently. I don't want to get overly political, but um, I think about the, 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 uh, the imminent uh, threat of mass deportation um of people who have come here to try and build a better life for themselves and it's kind of heartbreaking that they that so many of them have come here and are working hard and doing what they can to to like i said to make a better life for themselves for their children other family members etc and they have people that just because they they weren't born here or they didn't come here through the way that that they thought they should, that they don't want them here, that they're not, that they consider them not welcome because they're different from them. And I just think about the sheer bravery that that, that, that requires. And even though in the story, Abraham had these promises from, from God, it still required immense bravery to, to uproot everything and to go to a new, a new place that you want to call home. Mm-hmm. Don, you had your hand up? Yeah. Um, I guess I don't see the um, passages in the same way. Um, I I think it, it talks about um, God, um, you know, um, telling Abraham that he can, he needs to go. He, not that he should not that he should go for his own good because of being oppressed where he is but just there's another place where mm -hmm. 
it's going to be his. They're not going to be in the minority. They're going to be in the majority. And that can have problematic consequences. Um, I think the thing that's not included uh, as the flip side of uh, God's promise to bring uh, all of Abraham's uh, uh, descendants together and keep them uh, and protect them in their land. But the other side is if you're wicked and you don't follow my commandments, that I'm going to scatter you like the dust in the wind. Mm -hmm. And when I think about that, I think of from a religious standpoint, um, and this is a conversation or something that really, I guess, Jews used to think about before the Holocaust, but they stopped after the Holocaust, which is, is it really moral from a Jewish standpoint for the Jews to um, go back to Jerusalem? In other words, under their own desire? Mm. Or do they have to wait for the Messiah to come? And if they do try to consolidate back in the in Jerusalem, that they are in fact sinning against God. Hmm. And that, that I think was a conversation that was having quite often um, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. But it went away not because of religion, but because of actually secularism mm -hmm. in the sense that we don't care what God wants. We, we need to protect ourselves. And so we need to go somewhere where we can be together and protect ourselves. So in that sense, uh, the state of Israel is actually an anti-religious um, concept. Mm -hmm. Martin. Um, yeah. Um, I was just thinking about how the, the name of the parasha is Lech Lecha, which has several different meanings, but one of the meanings is go go to yourself. Uh, and so several people mm -hmm. have interpreted that as um, Abraham needed to go uh, into this other land to become himself, basically. Um, and that reminded me of uh, emig emigration stories and immigration stories in my own family and how... Um, I think about how my grandparents came here in the mid fifties to the UK. And back then it was maybe a three day journey um, for them to go back home. But at that time, it, that was a very difficult journey. It wasn't going to be the kind of thing that they did on a regular basis. Um, I think that my parents only, well, my mum only got to visit Italy four or five times when she was a child. Um, and I have photos of my great great grandparents. Um, it's really old fashioned, and they they must have been born in the late nineteenth century, you know, like eighteen seventies or something. Um, and two of the three of the children in one of the pictures uh, stood next to my great grandmother and her brother are her elder siblings who emigrated to America, um, and. Uh, two of them went to Wisconsin, Madison. Um, one of them had 11 children hmm. and <laughs> they've all got grandchildren and great grandchildren. And so there's, <laughs> but you know, like this huge difference in identity between those of us that stayed in Europe, but near enough to be able to have regular contact and those that went on a, I don't know if anyone can help me uh, understand how long, that journey would have been by boat back then. But is it like a few weeks? At least. It was, maybe yeah. a month or more. Yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. So they never came back. And we are we're only in uh contact because of letters and I know that when my parents got married, telegrams were sent because it was nineteen seventy nine. <laughs> Um, and when I was a child, we used to speak to our relatives on the phone uh, once a week 
uh, if that. And everybody was there because back then not everybody had a phone. People would go to my great aunties or whoever's. Um, but there was this kind of never seeing people in real life uh, mm -hmm. kind of contact. And so those great grandchildren of my great grandparents' siblings, um, most of them, I don't feel like we have anything culturally in common. They've just gone to this the new world as they would have seen it never to come back uh and a new identity there's a completely new identity and even even in terms of what it meant um for them uh in terms of their italianness or jewishness or whatever um so i feel like it's relating to abraham and how he took his family to this foreign land that isn't really that far away but they were going by foot so for them it was mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it was probably like going to italy in the 50s um mm -hmm. by foot <laughs> so i just somehow felt that there was this um connection in this in the stories and how the new identities are created in in that distance absolutely well what you just shared reminds me of something from my family my most recent immigrant ancestors and most of my it's with the exception of my indigenous american ancestors most of mine immigrated from europe in the 16 and 1700s so very few of my almost all of my ancestors were in the americas by by the time of the american revolution most of them came before that uh, one exception, though, I have some uh, German ancestors who came in the 1850s, and that's kind of – and what's significant about that is at the time they were in a northern part of Germany, which at that time still pretty much operated in something very similar to the feudal system, enough that people weren't allowed to leave the the, the place that they lived without permission of the Lord and all of that – and then industrialization came and all of a sudden the lords realized uh, we don't want all these people now. We don't need so many people. And so they encouraged immigration. And so this family that came across, they were of that generation and they were very anti-aristocratic, very anti that system. And so when they got to and they settled in north northeastern Missouri and Missouri was a border in, in bear in 1850s. So right after that was the U.S. Civil War. And so in the U.S. Civil War sprung Missouri was a border state with many people siding with the South, especially. But in their area, all the German immigrants went with the North. And the reason for that was, was that they associated the aristocratic slavery culture of the, the of the Confederacy with what they saw in Germany. And they actually initially um, organized their own militia unit to fight against the Confederacy because their their state government at that time was still going to go with this, the South. And I really admire the fact that they did this, and I've thought about it a lot, and I think a lot of it was they took that vow, they they took the lesson they learned in the old country with them, and that is that systems, oppressive systems that oppress ordinary people are, are bad and should be, be pushed against. And so I admire the fact that they took the lesson they learned over there, but they applied it here, and which which side they went with in the Civil War. What what grabbed me in the text was the the line about making the land great. That 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 was in the text, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that reminded me of the phrase "Make America Great Again," which um, <laughs> which I currently don't approve of, um, and uh. When I think of immigration, I think of my grandmother fleeing from uh, from Austria in the 1930s. And uh, from the, this country where it's gotten so she's not allowed to have a say in what goes on anymore to a country where once she becomes a citizen, she never misses an election. And um, there have been things s since her death that my mom was glad she wasn't 
alive to see. Like, mm. for instance, some of the things the Bushes have done. Um, and now there's something going on that my mom, if she thought about it, would be really glad my grandmother isn't alive to see. So how can we really make the land great? Is the question on my mind because mm -hmm. I mean countries can be great so well and intertwined in what you said Catherine I'm thinking about to the complicated nature of being Jewish in our because we have another identity and yet, and it's a national identity. Being being a part of the Jewish people is, in a sense, a, a peoplehood. It's a it's a a, a, a nation. Um, and yeah, goes again. We have the state of Israel, um, but even not even taking that side of it, it's just the idea of a separate peoplehood. And so, to me, that's another layer of complexity and the relationship that Jews have always had, positively and negatively, with with the the nations around them and how we all interact. Mm -hmm. And Don, I see your hand up and then Martin. Yes. So uh, I was wondering, so I'm, I was looking through the, um, the, the email or the, the document. Uh, and I was wondering, is that story about uh, them uh, going down to Egypt? Is that part of the, of La Havana? Or is that Let so, me jump okay. ahead because I so don't remember. A, so there's a whole there bunch a, of stuff. Yeah. I think well, it comes later. I don't remember if it's in that portion or not, but they I know at later point that the family does go to Egypt for a time, but I don't remember exactly where yeah. in the chronology. So so that document is not all supposed to be part of what we're talking about, right? It's just well, we can talk about whatever. I, I was just using that as a springboard to see where it takes us to. So if you if you that's not a problem if you want to go there. He no, I don't. Abraham I goes. Abraham goes to Egypt to escape famine in Lech Lecha. Okay. Okay, that is in there. Okay. Yeah. Well, then, I have some thoughts on that, which are disturbing. <laughs> well, but I'll keep them to myself. Okay. Well, any other thought? Oh, Martin, you have your hand up. Yeah. Um, I just kind of wanted to bring up uh, the Bund because um, Don mentioned, and I think a couple of people have mentioned, the, the land of Israel and how there was the Yiddish Bund in the Russian Empire or the, towards the end of the Russian Empire and how all of the other sort of groups uh Ethnic would be the wrong term, but all the, what we would now call ethnic groups um, were were given their own nation within the so but we're not so you know within the Russian Empire, and they had represent sort of a representation, and that did actually carry on into the Soviet Empire, uh, Soviet Union, um, and the Yiddish speaking Jews of of the of the, uh, of of that time wanted a Jewish uh, nation. Um, so, um, I've just, I've just been told that I'm talking for a long time by, <laughs> by Zoom. <laughs> it said, well, lower your hand because you've been talking for a while. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> uh, it distracted me. I thought it was someone telling me I'm talking. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> where was I? Yeah, they, um, so they formed the Bund. Um, and they wanted that, you know, that Yiddish was their language and they wanted that as a representation. And they um, spoke about uh, that form of Jewish autonomy as a here-ness, um, which I can't remember if that's doikait. Um, and and, the, and Zionism, they referred to as theirness. So mm -hmm. they saw that the, the Zionists wanted to recreate uh you know this jewish autonomy over there in another place but they were concerned with over here and um you know uh fighting for our rights as jews where we live 
And I've always felt like inspired by that because I understand both perspectives, but I always say to people sometimes in these debates that I would prefer to fight for my rights where I am than recreate mm -hmm. my identity in another place. Mm -hmm. I got Jamie and then Val. That's right. Jamie and then Val. Hi, can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> migration, I think of my grandfather, my paternal grandfather right away. Uh, he came from Croatia in the 1930s to Canada. And uh, back then he had to work on a farm for a period of time. You just couldn't, you had no choice. And um, how he had to crisscross the country during the Great Depression for work. Uh, there was no social support. Uh, so he worked in British Columbia and all over the place uh, and in mining and all kinds of different jobs. And it was difficult for him because, of course, he didn't speak English. Uh, and, um, you know, there was a lot of discrimination at that time. Um, a lot of the culture in English Canada anyways was very um, British oriented and uh, people from Eastern Europe were were not warmly received let me tell you that <laughs> there was a lot of names uh, applied to them and my father remembers them well even though eventually believe it or not he actually uh, married outside of his ethnic group and my paternal grandmother is actually british and was born in england uh but that whole uh thing you were talking about earlier uh about um leaving europe and he left alone um, he only had a brother who came later was very brave uh, and um, I'm not even sure you know like I come to Panama a lot and I, and uh, for different reasons and uh, but that whole idea of leaving your home and your and where you grew up is is um, it is scary um, and um, I've watched on television here uh, as you know Panama has the Darien Gap and a lot of the migrants cross over treacherous, uh, treacherous jungle terrain because there is no road between uh, Panama and Colombia. So they really take their life literally in their hands. Eventually, of course, they're trying to migrate to the U.S. probably. But um, it was something to see because, I mean, I don't think media really covers that part of it in the United States and Canada that I've seen. What these people go through, it's awful. I mean, it's it it it's, it 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 uh, it brings tears to my eyes. Okay, I mean, it's 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 you know you see people, mothers and kids and and everything, um, and um, I don't know. Um, I just wanted to bring that up um, because I mean, a lot of people right now. If if uh, I watched, uh, there was a person who spoke on I think it was CNN, and and he was um, saying that you know when they talk about deporting you know illegal criminals he said well most of them do get deported and have are deported he says what you're talking about now is basically breaking up families you're talking about you know maybe you know a grandmother or a grandparent or a sister or somebody who is not doing anything illegal uh risking being deported and um it's going to be uh, very heart-wrenching when it starts to happen um, of course, uh, I mean, I understand people's view that, you know, if you came in illegally, then you're either you're illegal and Canada deports people too. I'm more quiet about it, but you know, we, we do have deportations going on. Um, but I think, uh, after watching a lot of the uh, feedback online of, of people thinking of, of leaving the U S because of what's going on, um, I think staying and, and, um, in solidarity with others and resisting and uh, fighting back. I mean, legally, obviously, uh, is way is the way to go. Um, I mean, where you where are you going to really run to? I mean, um, where you're not going to expand it because the the pro the, the thing is with U.S. elections is they spill over, and so when a really right wing government takes place in the United States, it's not just the United States that's impacted by that. I mean most countries will be impacted by that. And unfortunately, a lot of the alt-right in other countries gets motivated and starts doing things. Um, anyways, it's a scary time. I am I am fearful. Um, I am a part of multiple minorities. and uh, But 
I mean, uh, resistance. I've, I've been in many marches before and uh, had nasty words said, uh, but I think we have to uh, resist and do our best to, to fight back in whichever way that is. Thank you, Jamie. Have Val and Phyllis up next. Thank you. Um, I I totally agree with Jamie on the, the overflow and staying in solidarity, but that, that's the indigenous part of me. I'm just tired of the, the nonsense. But as for um, as for immigration, I'm like you, James. I am half indigenous or partially indigenous and partially European. So it's a constant battle for me to, because I hear the hypocrisy. I'm like, all y'all are complaining about illegal immigration and there wasn't really any legal immigration until at least the 1930s. So everybody before that basically came to the U.S. the same way that they're coming to the U.S. now. And folks coming from south of the border are indigenous peoples. They don't want to leave their land. I, I My father was the first one to leave our, our ancestral land. And I hightailed it back when I was 19 because it's there's like a connection. So these people, the last thing they want to do is leave their land, just like anybody else who came over during, you know, from Europe. Um, I had family here as well that came over in the, the 16th and 17th century. And I had some that came over in the, the 20th century. The ones who came over before that had that colonizing mindset. We're going to come here. We're going to tell you how to behave. We're going to take over the land. This is what you need to assimilate to our beliefs. So that was, although they were anti-monarchy, um, imperialist, they, were, they became those imperialists. And then in the 19th century, my, my Italian ancestors that came over here, they assimilated. We had ghettos, quote unquote, here for Italians. Um, where Martin's family moved to in Milwaukee, it was more um, Nordic than it was Italian. But my family moved to New York and New Jersey. So it was a, an Italian ghetto and uh, with Madison. It was still very, it was still very um, Nordic <laughs> um, and German. So they um but they, they had to assimilate there was no choice they changed their their last names they spoke english now the foreign languages are no longer available in our home because our parent our parents were so anti-cultural um that you had to learn english and you learned nothing else so but i when i hear this 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 passage it reminds me of okay so they traveled but did they they brought their beliefs with you and it's okay to bring your beliefs with you but we did wind up pushing them onto other people and expecting them to behave as we did or believe like we did. And if you didn't, we killed you. So, I mean, there are plenty of stories of, of people being killed in the Bible. So that, that still has an, I still have an issue with that because you're bringing people you've acquired. Um, they've now lost their identities. You're forcing another identity on them. And then you're going into another land where people will probably be okay with you being there because there's enough land to do it. Um, if, if you can, you can have your space, um, have your laws, have your language, but why would you force that on somebody else? Live within that society. And you might actually become a, a closer knit community. I'm actually in a class right now on ethics and what's going on in the Middle East. And uh, it's, it's like a ticking time bomb. And I'm the only one saying, well, it's no, it's not a good thing to have a genocide because no, what, when, what went on was, you know, terrible in history. But you also have to understand that you guys keep forgetting to mention the people that were killed in Israel. You know, you keep forgetting that there were people that, you know, were kidnapped and killed. And so not justifying genocide at all, but it's a constant battle between colonization and being there and indigenousness. And I feel like that's an, a, an everyday battle for me. So, yeah, yes, that's my very long winded explanation. Thank you. Phyllis. Um, so. Yeah, I had an interesting conversation with someone this week um, or last week about um, <laughs> taking over America, basically. Um, so I agree that, you know, th I think the problem comes in when we don't live to live, when we don't learn to live cooperatively. Um, this young man explained to me that the indigenous peoples had no rights to the land in the first place because they were migratory people and they moved all around. And so they didn't own the land either. They never thought they did own the land and therefore the land was available for anybody to take. So he and his people were right to come over here and just grab it and take it. And I looked at him and thought at first he was joking, but he was not joking. He honestly believes that. And so I said, well, then how do you explain slavery? Because you went to another country and brought folks over here 
Oh, slavery exists. Don't get me started, he says. Slavery existed everywhere long before we did that. I said, so you're okay with taking other people's land and then robbing people and bringing them over here and treating them like chattel? And I said, yeah, you're right. I mean, what do you do? You don't argue, you can't argue with insanity. And I think that's what we have to admit is there, there is a certain population of people out there that have gone completely crazy. They have lost their cotton picking minds to use a phrase. And, <laughs> and to try to reason with insanity is insanity. You're not going to reason with people who are insane. They are not thinking right. They are not going to ever think right. And the best we can do is, I think, is to commune together, to huddle together, to try to, you know, survive it, to get together and do what we have to do, you know, um, and make it through, you know, and make sure we don't perish because the sane people cannot perish while the insane are in rule or all we have left is the insane. Mm -hmm. You know, and at the rate we're going, there's a lot of insanity going on out there. I don't want to waste my energy and time fighting with them. I don't want to waste my energy and time, you know, marching because they're going to kill me. I live in a state where they will shoot me. Wisconsin, yeah, don't come here. <laughs> okay, just don't come here. Um, they will shoot you and ask questions later. I mean, all of you are very lucky that you don't look like me. You know, um, there, there's just, there's a certain amount of fear that you live with when you're different in this country now. Because yes, while this is a country that was built by immigrants and it was built by enslaved peoples, there, that's not respected anymore. And most of the people screaming and yelling and hollering are from immigrant families themselves, which is mm -hmm. kind of crazy to me. I'm not yeah. going to argue with insanity. I'm not going to spend any part of my time arguing with insanity. I'm going to survive it like my people have done for hundreds of thousands of years all the way back to Moses. I'm going to survive it so that some of the strong will be around when the crazy go down. That's my mind. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like it. Jeffrey. Yeah, I have been uh, trying to be shot recently. I was out campaigning for a city council candidate last year, and uh, some uh, people in the Aryan Brotherhood didn't appreciate that and trying to shit me. So, <laughs> uh, jokes on them. I did my canvassing, only missed one house. It was the house that prevented me from going to and reported. It. <laughs> but yeah, he's, he's got to do what he got to do in life. Um, don't don't let the haters stop you. Yeah. Absolutely. One thing I'll, I'll mention in the chat that's from the chat that's really important. Martin posted, we need to acknowledge that we as Jews are currently being beaten in public. Amsterdam two days ago. And it's a really horrifying story. Um, yeah, I, I will say I talked to a rabbi friend of mine who originally is from Amsterdam and she gave some more context to it. But it's horrifying. There's no doubt about it. Um, at the same time, a complicated factor is some of the Israelis did behave in some really bad ways prior to the attacks. It still doesn't justify violence, um, and not at all. Um, but but it is. I mean, what's what's I think horrifying to me is just that the widespread nature of it. That the fact it was frankly there is almost an organized element to some of these attacks. Uh, it's just horrifying and. I do think it's a reminder for us in the U.S. not to assume that, at least as it relates to anti-Semitism, there may not be a safe place in the world. This well, is, there's a lot. Oh. oh, go ahead. No, just that this is a element of what's going on in Israel and Palestine that is really difficult and complex because um, I remember the day after October the 7th, and I was doing some work in a, a mental health charity that's uh, hosted by a kosher restaurant um, or a cafe. It's called Headroom and it's like a charity, um, but it's kosher. And the next day after October the 7th, our door was smashed, as was another kosher restaurant. Um, and three Palestine stickers were put on the door, on the smashed door. Um, and that stuff's happening a lot that there are people driving around 
uh, walking around with Palestine flags. My partner is where, where, where's the Star of David? Somebody grabbed it in a bar and said, pre-Palestine, you know, and he, he found that very ironic because um, we, you know, he's, I, I, not that I'm not left, but he's even more left than me in terms of this, where he's positioned in this. Um, so that's something that a lot of Jewish people in the UK and, and, and I'm, I'm sure in, I know in Canada because I was there and, you know, people are debating this online and in the United States, etc. A lot of Jewish people are finding very difficult about the current what's going on, because at the same time that we're supporting as left wing Jews, um, supporting Palestinian rights, we're also being beaten for being Jews. And so it makes it very difficult to know, you know, I mean, it doesn't shift your position on the on what's going on, but it makes it complicated. Absolutely. Phyllis and then Paul and Betty Ann. So be aware that the that the hatred is, you know, running real thick. Um, there are children in Chicago that are receiving messages to say, um, be ready to go pick cotton at three o'clock. I'll pick you up. So if your children have cell phones, be aware that, you know, and they and they haven't been able to trace who's sending these messages to their their children of color and they're receiving these messages on their cell phones. Be ready to go pick cotton. I'll pick you up. So, you know, the hatred is running thick <laughs> um, for all different peoples. Um, just be aware your children have cell phones. You might want to be checking what messages they're getting. Mm. That sounds like good advice. Um, I just wanted to point out that the people who were upset about the election, but are anti-Israel, um, anti the what the government of Israel is doing. Let's just say, how do you know now your government is going to be this horrible government? Are you held responsible for that? Are we supposed to hold you responsible for that? Are we supposed to shun you? Are we supposed to spit at you? Are we supposed to do the same thing they're doing to us as people who just happen to be Jewish and um, probably never liked the net you know, government anyway? Um, the shoe is now on the other foot. That's all I want to say. Yeah. Well, we've had some really good discussion this morning, and I know that many of us needed to unpack some things it's just nice we'll do that in a supportive community i i do want to mention that since this is shabbat i, I really hadn't been planned for us to go quite as deep into some of this hard stuff so i just want to mention that um it's also completely fine on shabbat to say um to take space away from the struggle too so i i kind of want to acknowledge that that dynamic as well in this uh because it's hard and we also i'll just say that at least to me, particularly for those of us who are going to be in this struggle for a long time, uh, we have to take care of ourselves. And I think Shabbat is a, is a core survival tactic, frankly. Um, Shabbat helps us in many ways. So we'll continue and we, we can have more time. We'll, we'll leave the Zoom op open after the service for more conversation. But I want to move on to a few more pieces of our liturgy this morning. And so I'm going to do share screen for this next part and let me uh queue up um okay so we now turn our hearts and minds towards those who need our love who are ill who are lonely who suffer pain and who have been wronged let us pause as we call out their names i'll i'll just say that uh, i'll just add for um just say then won't say their names, but I have several of my uh, clients who are really struggling mental health wise this last week, and it's been been hard to be their companion through through this. So for all all those who are struggling with anxiety, depression this week, I want to remember them. Who else are we remembering today? My friend Bob, Stephen Rainey, Robert. Rosary and Phil. Barbara, Marion, and Rob.
Marcia, John, Valerie, and Javier. To those who long for healing, refuah lema with compassion and with feeling, we say refuah lema. There's a light inside you that is there to guide you, to help you find the strength you need. Refuah lema. And may you feel a sense of peace. Refuah lema. Let us make peace in the world. Let us make peace for us, for all Israel and for all humanity. And we say amen. Nahase shalom baholam. Nahase shalom aleinu. That's not the right. Nahase shalom baholam. Nahase shalom aleinu. Ve'al ko Yisrael. Ve'al ko yoshve tevel. And so we now come to our time for the Kaddish. And so if there are names that you're remembering today, uh, please speak them out or put them in the chat. And then we'll stop the screen share just for a second so I can... And as always, we remember also those who have no one to mourn, mourn them, those, those in past generations who have been lost. Ivan, Irene, Joseph, Helen, and James Edward. Please stand in body or in spirit. May there be a good remembrance and compassion and kindness and love from all the world upon the names of our honorable loved ones who have passed from the world. Let us make a place in our hearts to remember their good names, a good memory, and let us honor them with good deeds. May their memory be a blessing forever. Amen. Would someone like to recite the Hebrew side? Yehena zichron tov vechesed berachamin vehava michol haolam al shemot hamechuvade yakirenu sheavarim min haolam havan insor beribenu et shemot atovim vezichram atov venokiram bemasim tovim zichronam nivracha lealam vaed. Amen. Amen. And now we come to the Elenu. Who would like to recite this? It is upon us to praise the beauty of the world, even as we fall and rise up, and to continue the work of repairing the world. For within us is the power to build and repair, and it is in our hands to bring about liberation. And one day, humanity will be united and one in purpose. And so now, it is time for Kadush. So, if you have wine or some other tasty beverage handy, go ahead and grab it. And let us raise our glasses. The sixth day, and on the seventh day, we complete the labor which we perform, and we refrain on the seventh day from all our labor. And we bless the seventh day and set it aside, for we refrain from all the labor which we have to do. And now, keeping our glasses raised, Yom Hashishi 
ותקל ביום השביעי המלקה אשר נעשתה, ותשבות ביום השביעי כל המלקה אשר נעשתה. נברק את יום השביעי ונקדש אותו. כי בו שבתנו מכל המלקה אשר בקרנו לעשות. סברי, קברים וקברות. Attention, friends, and we raise our glasses some more. Baruch ha'hor b'kayim, b're p'ri ha'gafen. And we all say amen and l'hayam. And then if you have bread handy, let us lift up our bread. Blessed are those that bring forth bread from the earth. Berukim ha'motzim lekim min haretz. Amen. And Shabbat Shalom. We will, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, also, um, just to, we had on the chat um, a few other names. Um, Jonathan, Wanda, Jean, and those who have been forgotten. So I want to thank everyone for this time together. I, I really needed it this morning. So I, I, I hope that it was meaningful to you all as well. But this is one of those days I really needed Shabbat and needed to be here with our community. So I really appreciate it. I am going to go and turn off the recording now. But we'll leave the... Uh...